humanity and allows us to laugh and to experience things, even when everything else is so dark. Um, and so I don't really know what the future will be, but I do know that it will include art and storytelling because mm -hmm. if that is as closely linked to us as humans as it comes, I mean, we are made up of stories. You know, Joan Didion, <laughs> we tell ourselves stories in order to live, but we also tell ourselves stories order, in order to die and to remember everybody that we've come from and then hopefully to be able to push forward into the future. So that was a, that was a big long answer to that question, but um, I'm very passionate about the arts. <laughs> I think they're very important. <laughs> I wouldn't hope for anything less. <laughs> I um, no. So I'm going to ask you one more question and then I will do some rapid fire questions from folks who are watching this. Um, and the last question I think you very much touched on just now, but it is sort of about how knowledge and information get passed down. Um, you have a lot of folklore in your stories. You have a lot of um, sort of knowledge passed along matrilineal, um, you know, generational lines. And you also have a lot of mothers and grandmothers and daughters and sisters. So there's sort of this uh, female sharing of information. And so I'm just, can you talk a little bit about that and sort of the overlap maybe between folklore, mythology, faith, and also wisdom and intellect and sort of what we know? You are like, actually, you're like the best question. So I could like sit here and answer these for like hours. But <laughs> I'm like, where do we begin with all my thoughts? Uh, so one of the things that you yeah, this is so funny. Like when I was like on the road last year and I was traveling all over at these book events, every once in a while, I would get a question and it was usually from a man. Actually, I think it was always from a man and he would raise his hand and he would say, why is this book all about women? And <laughs> I, would, I would have to pause because I was like, I didn't, it never even occurred to me. Like I was just writing about what I wanted to write about and they happened to all be women. And there are men, I mean, there are men in these stories. So I was like, oh, come on. What about Tommy? You know, what about Manny? Um, but I realized the women, I mean, they loom so largely. And the basic answer to that is, I come from a family of seven children and there was only one boy sibling. So I grew up with this wild pack of girls and there were two sets of twins. And it was just like, you know, it was a very, it was like a girl, it was a, it was a girl tribe. <laughs> so that's what I was part of. And then all of my mother's family, the elders that told the stories that actually would open up were women. So it was grandmas, great grandmas, great aunties, all of the extended cousins, the storytelling, the storytelling trait really came through with the women in my family. And that's not, you know, that's not true for all families across the board, but my, that's how mine was. Um, but in terms of, I think in terms of the, the mythology and the folklore, so I grew up, you know, with indigenous customs, I grew up in the um, danza community, I grew up Catholic. I grew up, there's a lot of stories that were around me and a lot of reading. And uh, my mom, she used to read at mass. And even if she was hung over, because I knew she'd been partying all night the night before, she would just get up there so eloquent and beautiful. And she'd be like, and now a reading, you know? And so <laughs> it was just something that I just was always um, charmed by, I guess. Like, Anytime a great storyteller came on, came on the scene, I was like, oh, we got to pay attention. This is going to be good. We're going to learn something about being human from this. Um, and so I just, I love it. And I love embedding it inside of literary art. So I think even though we come from the oral tradition, we come from mythology, sometimes that's left out of literature. And I like to merge them both because what's happening inside my mind is a merging of them both. It's not just all the books that I've read are appearing on the page you're also seeing glimmers of all the, the folk tales, the times that I was scared shitless, that La Llorona was gonna get me. Like that is all inside of, of my literary knowledge mm -hmm. in a way, right? Yeah, stories and art, they're really gonna, they're gonna pull us through you guys. <laughs> I love it, I love it. <laughs> okay, we have folks with some questions for you. So I'm gonna kind of rapid fire these okay. as awesome. much as I can. Um, okay. I'm excited to already know the answer to this one, but <laughs> working on any books now and when will, you, will your next book come out? I am working on my book. <laughs> I promise you guys. So I am, um, 
I have a novel. So this is, I'm going to give you like, I'm going to back it up and give you like a, some story, story time. So I never thought Sabrina and Karina could get published because I had been rejected so often for so long. So my agent was like, you're going to have to write a novel in order to get this book published. And at the time I was like, I'm going to break up with my agent. I can't believe she's making me write a whole nother book. What is her problem? But I had started, <laughs> but I had, I had started a novel before I started my short stories, but I didn't have the skill level to complete it. And so this was around 2015 is when she told me how to start writing a new book. And then when we actually went out for sale, I didn't expect the publisher to want Sabrina and Karina. So I've had another, no I've had another book. I have a novel. It's historical. It's set between 1895 and 1933. And it's basically, it's taking some of my ancestors and putting them into their own storyline. And they, they're indigenous and they're Chicano and they're mixed. And I have Filipino characters because I'm part Filipino and I have Greek characters. And it's a big love story that's sweeping. And um, I'm supposed to be working on my edits right now, but I've been a little sad. So, <laughs> so I'm trying to like give it a, give it a few, you know, give it a few days and see if I, I can work without bringing that into the edits. Cause I don't want to like mess it up a little bit, but if all goes well, you should be seeing Woman of Light in 2021 or 2022, but it's it's coming and it's in the editorial stage. Yeah, that's a long answer. <laughs> I think that everyone needed that answer. <laughs> I think that, not that you asked, but it is such a strange time to be trying to make art. And I think that we would all do well to remind ourselves that we're all probably grieving and we don't have to be ready right now to just produce because we suddenly have a lot of time at home, you know? Yeah, I, I mean, I think that there's there was this myth early on when it first started that we'd have all this free time, but it's like, no, our minds are not free right now. Right. Like, it's like, so yeah, and if you're not like producing at your highest level, like don't don't feel bad. Like there's, how can you, how can you do that? Right, right. Okay. Um, what is your revision process like? Also, I don't know who asked these. Sorry, I didn't write that down. But um, it's a question. I don't know. I don't know. These are questions um, I asked you guys yesterday on my Instagram story. So those, some of you are getting your questions answered. <laughs> I'm sorry. I don't. I don't remember exactly who sent them in. Um, my revision process changes depending on the story or the novel or the project. Um, the most recent, I just wrote a brand new short story and the revision process looked like I actually wrote five versions of the same story. And I start over and I think I had kept the Word document all together and it was 58 pages like of me restarting and changing and just sewing it together in certain areas. And once I found what I actually wanted to do, I plucked that out and I wrote a whole new story on it and it ended up being around 20 pages. So one of the things I really had to learn to let go of is the idea that whatever I write is precious and it cannot be re re rewritten or revised. And that was really difficult for me to learn as a young writer. Um, I remember I had turned in a draft of Any Further West when I was in graduate school and a professor of mine told me to rewrite it. And I, I thought, oh, you're nuts. Like I would never, it's, it's obviously genius. Like I just <laughs> wrote it today. Um, and I remember being so angry that I went to the library and I got books on revision, like Bird by Bird and Stephen King's that I was like on writing. And I was like, I'm gonna learn what they think of it. And I realized, oh, you're actually supposed to revise. So I'm a pretty, I'm a pretty heavy reviser. I don't lie and say I'm not one of those writers who doesn't revise. This, everything you get is like very, except for Sugar Babies, that just came out like that. That was the only time that, was the only time that happened. But everything That's else is like- perfect. Yeah, it just, it just like that ending, I was like, <laughs> but I didn't have to revise it. So it's kind of weird. It's the only one. <laughs> um, okay, let's see. We have, do you ever have imposter syndrome in academia or creative spaces? If so, how do you overcome it? I, I used to, I used to definitely have imposter syndrome, um, especially because imagine we don't have to imagine a lot of us have probably been there. These are male dominant white spaces often, and they're also upper class spaces. Um, so when I was first entering into these academic spaces, I actually dropped out of my first MFA program in California. 
um, that's how that's how hard it was for me to adjust to this kind of world. It was like learning a new language. Um, I didn't I just I didn't come from those kinds of settings. But one of the ways that I slowly got over it is I just I used to tell my students this. I was like, no one cares about you. Like, <laughs> like I, I had to tell myself over and over again, like, these people have already shown they don't care about me. So they're not remembering any of the mistakes I've made. And they're not remembering me at all. So why do I care what they think of me? And it, I mean, it took a lot of years, but then I also just started focusing on my work and I would build my work up to know like in my heart, if I thought my work was good, it didn't matter um, if others were telling me it wasn't. Um, but it, it is, it's an, it's an ongoing process. Um, I remember being at like a happy hour for my first MFA program and telling someone who, you know, she had come from New York City and I think she had gone to an Ivy League for her undergrad. And I remember telling her that I was sort of embarrassed to say that I was a writer um, because I, how was I a writer? You know, I didn't, I didn't think that's what I was, even though I wrote my whole life since I could write. Mm -hmm. And uh, she kind of dismissed me and she said, oh, well, why do you think we're here? And just the way that she could have that like ownership of that. I said, like, well, maybe I should start doing that, but just be nice about it. <laughs> like, don't, be, don't be so mean about it. Like, you know, we, we aren't always, you know, not all of us are born into the world where we get to become authors. That was never going to happen in my, my reality, but it did. And I'm very excited it did. And I hope that there are a lot of people like me who feel like they can be authors now because there's writers like mm -hmm. me coming up. But yeah, get out of that imposter syndrome. Tell them go away. You don't need it. <laughs> Bring it. Yeah. All right. Um, I'm just going to ask you one more because we're about out of time. Um, what do you hope the Denver of the future will look like or feel like? I hope we get to go out into public again. <laughs> so I, I don't really, I don't know, but I, I've been thinking about this a lot. Um, I just, I want, I want a community again. I want to be able to walk to the places where I need to get my supplies. And I want to be able to walk to restaurants and just see familiar faces who come from my old neighborhoods, who come from a mixture of people. And, you know, one of the things that's really hard about new Denver, gentrified Denver, is the overwhelming um, feeling of being an outsider in the place where I come from. So I hope that in the future Denver, people who come from this space can feel like they belong again and that we don't have to feel just alien in the place where we come from. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay, well, thank you so much for being here. In case anyone missed it, we are here because Polly's wonderful short story collection, Sabrina and Karina, is coming in paperback. Paperback, you can, you can bend it. Oh, <laughs> it's so stretchy. Um, and we still have some hardcovers at Tattered Cover. You can order them online at tatteredcover.com. Um, but we are also really excited to see folks already pre-ordering the paperback. Um, in case oh, you don't know, pre-orders <laughs> mean a lot. For um, they help get first, first week sales up, which um, that's the type of thing that decides things like what goes on the New York Times bestseller list. So your pre-order means a lot. It means a lot to bookstores. It means a lot to authors. Um, and we're going to ship you your book for free right now because you're probably stuck at home. Uh, so, uh, you can do that at tatterdcover.com. We're going to have another conversation on Tuesday. Um, and thank you so much, Kali, for being here. Thank you, guys. Thank you to everyone who tuned in. This was really fun. Thank you, Tattered Cover, for having me. Bye, guys. <laughs>